This is Professor Darif Seitz. This Java tutorial focuses on primitive data types. Computing is frequently referred to as data processing, or DP, because the primary pattern of every program is input, process, output, where data is input into the program, processed by the program, and then output from the program. When it's input into the program, the data, which could come from a database or files, needs to be stored in memory, and that's where primitive data types come into play. Each field or variable that stores data has to have a type associated with it. Java is a strongly typed language. Types must be associated with every item, and Java is very particular about how types are moved about and, and used. We're going to look here at some boat data to illustrate primitive data types. The, we have a series of fields here representing the attributes of a boat of different data types. The first category we're going to look at is Boolean. Boolean, the key word there, has true or false values. It's like a flag, an on or an off, true or false. Each variable has to have a name. It's called an identifier. The rules for identifiers, they must begin with a letter. Uh, in some cases it could be an, also an underscore or a dollar sign, but that's not very common. And the subsequent characters can be letters, numeric digits, or underscores. The convention for names is to use what's called camel case. Each word in the name, the first letter is capitalized like the C here. The exception is the first word. The first letter will be capitalized only if it's a class name. Looking up here at our single class, primitive data types, it begins with a capital because it's a class. This field here, not a class, starts with a lowercase. It's called camel case because as you go across, there's humps where the capitals of each word begin. This first variable is also initialized through an assignment statement to a value of false. With an assignment statement, you have a right-hand side and a left-hand side, and the value on the right is moved into the value of the variable on the left. Moving down uh, to our next category here, character data type it represents single Unicode characters. The keyword is char. We have three fields here, a category, a fuel type, and a hull type. Comments beneath these fields uh, provide the meanings of the values that are allowed to be stored in them. For example, an F, capital F, represents a fishing boat. An S represents a sailboat. The next type of data is integer. Integer has no fractional part. There's no decimal point with precision digits to the right of a decimal point. It's just like whole numbers. It can be negative or positive. In the early days of computing, memory on computers was very small and the languages developed these concepts, these traditions where the different types had different widths. It's called starting out with a type called byte. It takes up one byte of storage and can take on values from negative 128 to 127. The next uh, larger uh, storage area is called short takes up two bytes. You can see the values there have a wider range. And moving through the list here, ints, which represents the word integer, are four bytes and their value range. And the longest ones are called long with eight bytes. <clears throat> Nowadays, computers have lots of memory and the memory you would save from these fields is so incons insignificant to the big picture that normally programmers just use the int type 
uh, rather than these other shorter types and would only use a long if something was that large. So I have all ints here for some other attributes of the boat. I have one short in here. Uh, we'll test something called loss of data later on in this program. Moving on to the floating point types, they have a fractional part, a decimal point and fractions, uh, decimals to the right of the decimal point. Some of the concepts here that would allow for that, length doesn't have to be an integral length, it could be a fractional length, weight, width, and there's no initial values to any of these. When you do not assign an initial value to a, a variable, it takes on the value 0 automatically, or its equivalent, such as up here on the Boolean, the equivalent is false for if you didn't use any default. <clears throat> also, you can have constants. Constants use the keyword final to indicate that they will not change once they've been initialized in the program. The program is not allowed to change them after that. The naming convention for constants is all uppercase characters with each word separated by an underscore. This constant here is a conversion rate. It's the miles per hour per knot. Knot is a nautical unit of speed. And so we have the miles per hour equivalent for one knot in this double value here. The program uh, after this begins the actual input process output part of the program. Before we get into that, since this is one of our very first programs, we need to understand the flow of the program. It has one main method, or function is another name for method. And so the program starts in the first line here, and it works its way. These are comments. There's nothing executable there. But it works its way down one line at a time in order sequentially. Again, that's called sequential flow of control. It just goes from top down one line at a time. It's the simplest uh, type of flow in a program. We'll be learning other types of flow uh, later. So down here now we get to the initialization part of the program, the input part. We take the variables we've set up and assign values to the ones where we don't uh, have not assigned a default value that we want to keep, such as number engines we assigned it a 1 already up there as a default, and we'll take that and keep it. But these other ones have new values. In particular, the category is S, indicating a sailboat. So this is data for a sailboat. The only processing statement in the program is right here. It's a simple calculation. Again, it's an assignment statement. On the right-hand side, we multiply the max speed, which is in knots, by this constant miles per hour per knot to get a new double max speed miles per hour. Then we go into the output part of the program which uh, displays data to the user on the system console using uh, strings and system out print line. You don't need to understand all this yet except for notice that all the fields are used here and they will be output in their default formatting or called unformatted uh, state. It, this last line here is really what outputs this string which is being built uh, one line at a time here. Finally we have a little block down here, a group of statements to test this loss of data. There's a print line to just make a space in the output and then we try to assign 50,000 to test loss of data. Test loss of data is a short. And we're trying to assign an int to it. The compiler is not going to like trying to put an int value into a short regardless of what the value is. An int is a wider range than a short and it's a possible loss of data. If we try to compile this program we get a syntax error and the compiler says there, 
possible loss of precision. That's another way of saying possible loss of data. It's complaining about the int going to the short. So what we'll do is we'll comment that out. And instead, let's suppose that the programmer was to try this other thing instead, to take the 50,000 and using this syntax here, parentheses with a type that's called an explicit cast. It's to cast the 50,000 to a short, it will actually chop it off to make it fit in the memory of a short. So we'll save it. And we'll see what happens. We'll see that that's going to cause a runtime error because you're going to lose data by doing that. We'll now run the program. And the output here displays all of our fields, all of our attributes for the boat, one by one. And then test overflow notice that it didn't work like the programmer maybe thought it would. Uh, you can't take the 50,000 and chop part of it off and expect to get anything meaningful. The com computer looks at memory locations in a certain way and certain bits mean certain things and it now thinks that this is a negative number. We'll close this output and note another thing here. Notice in this area that you don't need to really understand that I have a prefix here of S which represents the st string uh, object type. It's not a primitive type. Prefixes are sometimes also used on primitive types. For example, a boolean uh, program, programming conventions may state at a certain um, company where they're coding programs to use a B and you put a B there and then a capital S or perhaps a C and a, then a capital C here to represent character little I's and then the big letters so they would still start with a lower case but they could have prefixes D's for double so if you see uh, identifiers with prefixes like that that sometimes is used to let the programmers know what type of data it is just by looking at the name. I didn't do that here. I wanted the names to be very clear without any kind of uh, prefix in front of them. So that um, concludes this tutorial. Let's show the output one more time here. And we'll end the tutorial.